I'm really, really very pleased to uh, welcome Professor Megan Henning today with us. Uh, Megan Henning is Associate Professor of Christian Origins at the University of Dayton. She holds a master's degree in Biblical Studies from Yale Divinity School and a doctorate in New Testament from Emory University. Megan's first book at Mo with Mo Sibek on the pedagogical function of hell in antiquity is entitled Educating Early Christians Through the Rhetoric of Hell. Her second book, Health Hath No Fairy, Gender, Disability and the Invention of Dumb Bodies in Early Christianity with Yale University Press, examines health through the lenses of gender and disability studies. She is the recipient of grants and awards from the Jacob K. Javits Foundation, the Society of Biblical Literature, Yale Divinity School and Emory University, and has appeared in a documentary for the National Geographic Channel and on CNN. So Megan, we really delight to have you with us uh, today. Um, could I please ask you to uh, start with your talk? Yes, of course. Thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be with you today. I was so grateful for the invitation. Um, thank you, Dr. Gripu, for inviting me and sharing the session, and to Dr. Thea Gumaleri for organizing this forum. And of course, thank you for Oxford, to Oxford University for hosting such a wonderful group that has such um, exciting topics and sessions. I'm really excited to share some ancient, ancient texts with you today, which I believe you received um, via email um, that are not only eschatological in nature, but that reflect different perspectives on the afterlife, gender, and atonement, topics that are taken up in the eschatological thought of a number of faith traditions. While the texts that we are looking to, at today are late ancient and early medieval Christian texts, they are part of an apocalyptic tradition that was rooted in ancient Judaism, and they are tied to ancient traditions regarding the harrowing of hell that were enormously important for the theology of Eastern Christian tradition that eventually became the Orthodox Church. I'm going to begin here with a brief background of the Torah of Hell and the harrowing of hell traditions, and then offer some historical context and background for each of the Marian texts that we will look at today. Although the earliest Torah of Hell is a Christian text, the idea of touring an otherworldly space where bodies are separated based upon their actions on earth had important Jewish, Greek, and Roman antecedents. The Hebrew Bible consistently imagines the same afterlife fate is in store for everybody, the righteous and the wicked alike. Everyone goes to Sheol, but the idea that death or whatever comes along with it make no distinction between good people and bad people began to greatly frustrate the Hellenistic period authors, especially as we see here, the author of Ecclesiastes. A wise man has his eyes in his head, whereas a fool walks in darkness but I also realized that the same fate awaits them both. So I reflected, the fate of the fool is also destined for me. To what advantage then have I been wise? In this period, we begin to see distinctions being made about what happens to good people after they die. This change may be a consequence of interaction with non-Israelite worldviews, Hellenistic, Persian, Egyptian, Babylonian are all options or a natural development from older Israelite Judahite ideas or some complex combination of factors. In any case, the seeds for what eventually develop into full-blown concepts of the afterlife are planted in that second temple apocalyptic literature. Beginning in the third and early second century BCE, Jewish apocalyptic literature begins to flourish. These texts lament the sorry state of the world and speak about future times when a supernatural event will affect major change. Many of these apocalypses offer accounts of people journeying through the spaces of the dead led by a tour guide. As Jewish literature, such stories in and of themselves were novel, although the format was borrowed from Hellenistic works on the tours of Hades. 
and the reader gets to experience these tours just as they would in person. They are told to travel or look in a particular direction, and the text describes the landscapes as in vivid, in vivid detail to make the readers feel like they are really there. A key text in this genre, and likely the earliest, is the Book of First Enoch. In the Book of the Watchers section, which forms chapters 1 through 36 and is dated to the late 3rd, early 2nd century BCE, fragments of which have been found in Qumran among the Dead Sea Scrolls. In chapter 21, after Enoch is shown the place where the angels who rebelled against God are burned for eternity, he is taken to a mountain in the West. A motif replacing the underworld of Sheol and likely taken from Babylonian mythology, where he sees four deep and wide rooms. Enoch asks Raphael what they are for, and he is told that they are waiting rooms for the dead. Enoch is then curious why there are four rooms if they are all serving the same purpose. Raphael's answer highlights the sea change in thinking about what happens to the righteous and the wicked after death. Chapter 21, verse 9 says, These three places were made in order that they might separate the spirits of the dead. Before it goes on to explain why they need rooms for the sinning dead, Raphael first explains about what the fourth room is, which is for the righteous. And thus the souls of the righteous have been separated. This is the spring of water, and on it is the light. Now he turns back to the three places and explains what each is for, that each is for a different kind of sinner. The first cave is for the worst sinners, who are waiting for God's judgment and eternal punishment. Likewise, a place has been created for sinners when they die and are buried in the earth, and judgment has not come upon them during their life. And here their souls will be separated for this great torment until the great day of judgment and punishment and torment for those who curse forever and of vengeance on their souls and there he will bind them forever. The second is for people who have been murdered so they can ensure justice is served. And thus has been, a place has been separated for the souls of those who complain and give information about their destruction when they were killed in the days of the sinners. The third group are sinners again, but not especially bad ones. Thus a place has been created for the souls of men who are not righteous, but sinners accomplished in wrongdoing and with the wrongdoers will will be their lot. But their souls will not be killed on the day of judgment, nor will they rise from there. First Enoch makes a sharp contrast between specific categories of the wicked and the righteous. This paved the way for later apocalypses, which would take readers on detailed journeys to hell. The earliest of the Christian tours of hell, the Apocalypse of Peter, was written in the middle of the second century CE. Possibly in Alexandria, but it may have been used liturgically by Christians for centuries and influenced a number of the later tours of hell, like the Apocalypse of Paul and our Greek Apocalypse of Mary, which we'll be looking at in a few moments. The Apocalypse of Peter then contains certain features that are common to early Christian tours of hell, including the Marian texts that we will read today. Each tour has a tourist who is led on a journey through hell where they witness different kinds of bodily torments. In each case, the tourist asks the guide who this suffering person is. The guide responds by identifying the sin, allowing the reader to see the correlation between particular sins and punishments. And then it seems to adapt a, phrase, a modern phrase, we see the sin, not the sinner. These are all anonymous figures in these tours of hell. Most punishments in the tours of hell are also thought to be fitting in some way in relationship to the sin or the crime committed. Indeed, some punishments are very closely related to the sin, matching the ancient judicial standard of lex talionis or measure for measure punishment. These punishments were meant to fit the crime in measure and intensity, sometimes involving hanging by the offending body part, immersion in fire up to the offending body part, asphyxiation or tantalization. And I talk in the book a lot about the relationship between these punishments and contemporaneous carceral technologies um, that were being used as these texts were being written. Although the primary purpose of the tours of hell was to educate the living, 
they also contain some soteriological significance for the fate of the damned as well. And it is for this reason that I have argued that we need to be placing these apocalyptic texts in conversation with the ancient descent to hell traditions or the descensus. The earliest instance of the seer interceding for the unrighteous is likely in 1st Enoch 12 to 13, in which Enoch tries unsuccessfully to redeem the fallen watchers. In the apocalypse of Peter, Peter cries out saying, it were better for them if they had not been created, a lament that occurs frequently in the tours of hell. At the close of the apocalypse of Peter, the damned admit that God's judgment is righteous and good, and they resign themselves to the severity of their punishments. As we will see in the later apocalypses, including the Marian tours of hell, the plea for the damned becomes more effective over time, and the divine response becomes more specific. There are a number of Marian tours, but we will focus on two today, the earliest one and the most popular or widely read one. And um, now we're getting to the point in the slides too, where I just want to point out a number of the images on my slides are from the um, International Marian Research Library that is actually here on the University of Dayton campus. So I'm really grateful to have had the resources of that library, both for my research and um, for the presentation that I'm giving here today with those images. Um, and they do have research fellowships. If any of you are interested in Marian studies in particular, there are opportunities to come and use the, the library resources here um, in person. So the first text that we'll look at is the Book of Mary's Repose, um, or in the Latin, the Libra Requi Marian, which contains a tour from chapters 94 to 101 that may have been written shortly after the Apocalypse of Peter in the late second or early third century CE. This Dormition narrative traces the story of Mary's miraculous departure from the world. At their request, Mary and the apostles are shown Gehenna and asked about its inhabitants, following the pattern of questions and demonstrative explanation. This tour focuses on the ecclesial sins of a lector, a deacon, and a priest, describing both their sins and their measure-for-measure -measure punishments in detail. The lector, for instance, spoke glorious words, but he did not do them. His punishment is to have his mouth become a flaming razor for eternity. The parallels between the Book of Mary's Repose and the Apocalypse of Paul have led some scholars to suggest that this Marian tour of hell was source material for the Apocalypse of Paul. While some scholars have argued that the ecclesial sins and punishments of the Apocalypse of Paul originated in a post-Theodotian context, their prominence in a second or third century text requires that we amend that thesis, recognizing that punishment for sins of hypocrisy may have been part of an early stratum of the tours of hell genre. The medieval Greek apocalypse of Mary, apocalypses of Mary are based on the apocalypse of Paul. And I say apocalypses because there are a number of apocalypses of Mary in this period. In the Eastern church, the texts in which Mary tours, tours hell were even more popular than the Pauline tours especially in monastic communities in the Byzantine and Slavic world. Um, and this is saying a lot. It's the Apocalypse of Paul, for example, that Dante reads before he writes his Inferno. So the Apocalypse of Paul is incredibly popular in the West, um, but the Apocalypses of Mary rival that popularity and exceed it um, in the East. The Greek Apocalypses of Mary, or as they're sometimes titled, the Apocalypse of the All-Holy Mother of God Concerning the Punishments, were written between the 5th and 11th centuries, and they appear with variations in several manuscripts. The tours of hell in these texts focus on distinctively Marian doctrinal concerns, among other things. For instance, in one of the Greek apocalypses of Mary, the second group of sinners to be punished, immediately after those who do not worship the Trinity, are those who deny the incarnation and that Mary is the mother of God. Now that I've given you the backstory, so to speak, for the text that we're going to read together, here are a few spoilers um, <laughs> that are oriented around my own reading of the significance of these texts for thinking specifically about gender and atonement. Um, I argue that Mary comes to take on the role of the apocalyptic seer in the third century CE and beyond, and thereby subverts a tradition in which only Jesus and male apostles and saints could descend to the depths to witness torment, to preach to the damned, 
or to beg for clemency. Mary does all of those things. In the process, the tradition around her tour of hell takes on a different shape of those male apocalyptic seers. In addition to inhabiting the roles of apostle, saint, intercessor, and redeemer of the damned, Mary is first and foremost the suffering mother. In simultaneously mothering, beseeching, and imitating Christ, Mary subverts and reenacts ancient expectations of the female body. So um, I've listed here on the right for you a number of ways in which Mary is characterized in these texts. And I'm going to sort of give you a bit of more detail about each of them before we jump into reading the texts together. So as the seer, Mary has a number of things in common with the other saints who visit hell. Her questions drive the tour forward by drawing attention to specific sins, and she listens attentively to the responses of the angelic tour guide. Like the hell journeys of the apostles and Christ in some early dissensus traditions, Mary's trip to hell has soteriological significance, not only for the damned, but also for the audience of the text who might be encouraged to connect the sins and her otherworldly intercession with ethical practices and liturgical practices in this world. Nevertheless, Mary's tours are distinguished by their narrative framing and the emphasis on her role as the mother of Jesus. The textual accounts of her journeys to hell include repeated references to Mary as the physical mother of Jesus, nursing him and burying him in her womb and to her role as the spiritual mother of all the disciples, teaching, leading, and caring for the followers of Jesus after his death. Over time, however, this composite image of Mary shifts so that her biological motherhood is no longer the focus. Mary's role as mother in the apocalyptic tours of hell is grounded in broader ancient ideas about motherhood, as well as earlier Christian ideas about her distinctive relationship to Jesus. In the apocalypses, Mary's pure body highlights the complexity of her spiritual and physical relationship with the child Jesus and the struggle of early Christians to reconcile ancient understandings of holiness, family, and motherhood. This struggle requires Mary to emerge as a mother who is able to perform her role through both conventional and unconventional means. Mary's body served this important role as a bridge for early Christians in liturgy as well, in which celebrations of Mary as divine mother assert the reality of Jesus's humanity, even as late as Athanasius. In each of these apocalyptic tours of hell, Mary as mother is a bridge that connects bodily summer, the bodily suffering of human existence with the divine. The medieval Marian tours of hell downplay her bodily experience of motherhood and distinguish her maternal role from biological motherhood. This distinction enabled devotees to focus on her access to the divine and intercessory power, while also distancing her from the impurity and suffering that were associated with the female body. This move was more pronounced in Latin Christianity because Eastern Christianity did not have a doctrinal focus on original sin. Eastern authors did not have to solve the problem of Mary's purity. For them, she simply is pure. Even the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Mary, which is based upon the Apocalypse of Paul, demonstrates this Western Christian preoccupation with the impurity of the female body and the admonition about preventing menstruating and pregnant women from touching the text, which is at the end of the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Mary. By contrast, Eastern Christian texts like the Book of Mary's Repose focus on Mary's spiritual motherhood for Christological reasons to secure her distinctive role as spiritual mother so that she can perform her unique roles as master and mother of our master. Those are both titles that are given to her in the text, as you'll see when we look at the Book of Mary's Repose. For Eastern Christian traditions, Mary's role as mother is not inherently biological, but spiritual. Inviting women and men to follow Mary's example, regardless of their bodily relationship to the cultural norms of motherhood. Richard Balcom has noted that the apocalyptic seers and early Christian tours of hell are all exemplary figures in Jewish and Christian piety. 
Mary certainly fits this characterization, and she has the added distinction of being the first woman to fulfill the role of apocalyptic seer in hell, to be followed much later by Anastasia in the Byzantine apocalypse of Anastasia. The other prominent seers, Peter, Paul, and Ezra, are male apostles or saints. In the dissensus tradition, it is typically either Christ or other male apostles who descend. For audiences familiar with the apocalyptic and dissensus traditions, Mary's presence as seer may have suggested that she was also an apostle. In the apocalyptic tours of hell, Mary often accompanies, leads, and teaches the other apostles. She is also set apart from the 12 as the mother of light and the all holy mother of God. Mary is depicted in the book of Mary. Mary's repose as a particularly wise disciple who teaches the male disciples from her profound knowledge of the cosmic mysteries and leads them in worship. She is the recipient of secret knowledge revealed by a great angel, and in fact, her son Jesus on the Mount of Olives. And she mediates that esoteric knowledge to the apostles. It is difficult, however, to tease apart Mary's discipleship and teaching from her roles as mother and intercessor. Her teaching and devotion to Jesus are always cast in the light of the incarnation and her special role as the Theotokos. Mary is the disciple and teacher par excellence because of her unique access to both the divine and human suffering. In some ways, Mary's intercession in the apocalyptic tours follows the pattern of intercessory dialogue associated with male apostles and saints. She is unique, however, in her ability to intercede with her son on behalf of sinners. We have evidence that Marian intercession was commonplace prior to the Council of Ephesus. The fifth century sermons of Severian of Gabala, for example, specifically echo the kind of intercessory theology that we find in the tours of Hal. Severian uses language of spiritual warfare to depict Mary. The enemy, armed to the teeth, thought that the woman was worthy of derision, but he found her to be a valiant general, Severian says. He goes on to say, he, Satan, did not think that he would be placed in the tomb, but he found the grave. He thought that she was dead, but was put to death by her. Severian's language here mirrors the fishhook metaphor, employed in descriptions of Jesus's death as cosmic victory over Satan. Severian presumed that his Antiochene audience understood that Mary's intercession was effective because of her multiple roles. She is the mother of salvation ensconced in heaven and the warrior who is able to kill Satan because he underestimates the battle tactics of a woman. Mary not only intervenes for sinners, but also succeeds in vanquishing Satan. This idea is recapitulated in the Eastern Christian traditions about the descent to hell, in which hell is overcome entirely. By the medieval period, Mary's unique role as Jesus's mother means that Jesus cannot refuse her. The effectiveness of Mary's intercession reflects broader cultural ideas about filial piety in which a son is expected to show devotion and deference to his mother. In the book of Mary's repose, Jesus tells the damned, because of the tears of Michael, my holy apostles, and my mother Mary, because they have come and they have seen you, I have given you nine hours of rest on the Lord's day. Here, Mary and the apostles win a more specific respite for the damned than the apostle of Peter's general statement that the elect and righteous will be saved. They enter heaven, but not the Elysian fields in the apocalypse of Peter 13. And in both the book of Mary's repose and the Greek apocalypse of Mary, Jesus himself specifies that it is because of his mother's tears that the damned are awarded a period of rest, emphasizing the effectiveness of a mother's lament and sadness upon her son. All of the Marian tours of hell emphasize this connection between Mary's intercession and her unique relationship to Jesus. This emphasis distinguishes them from other tours of hell. Whereas the seers in other apocalyptic tours of hell are guided by mediating angels, Mary's tour guide is Jesus, highlighting the special access that she has to her son. In the Greek apocalypse of Mary, Mary not only begs for mercy for the damned, but also asks to suffer with the damned herself. 
when she encounters a man hung up by his tongue, for instance, in the Greek Apocalypse of Mary 15, Mary says the Kyrie eleison in his stead, as he is not able to cry out for mercy for himself. Also in the Greek Apocalypse of Mary, intercession couched in a female body looks very different from the intercession of Paul or Ezra. And you can see that on the slide in front of you. In the Apocalypse of Paul, Paul says, Lord God, have mercy on what you have made, have mercy on the children of men, have mercy on your own image, begging and reasoning with God. Ezra says, have pity on the works of your hands, merciful and greatly pitying one. Condemn me rather than the souls of the sinners, for it is better to punish one soul and not bring the whole world to destruction. Again, Ezra is here using philosophical reasoning and the identity of God as the merciful one. In the Greek Apocalypse of Mary, we see Mary stretching forth her immaculate hands to the immaculate throne of the Father and saying with a great voice, Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, the invisible Lord who loves mankind, compassionate master, have mercy on the sinners for I have seen, Lord, their great afflictions and punishments. And I cannot bear their pain. Command your servant, master, that I also will be punished with the Christians. Paul and Ezra's requests for mercy follow the apocalyptic literary trope of philosophical and theological debate between the seer and God. This is particularly pronounced in all of the Ezra apocalypses. Their testimony is delivered in a divine courtroom, a setting that draws upon and also magnifies the judicial fears of the earthly courtroom. Paul reminds God that the damned are made in his own image, whereas Ezra's request recalls the Johannine framing of Jesus's atoning sacrifice. Mary intercedes not by offering an extended philosophical argument or a theological proposition of substitutionary atonement, but through her willingness to suffer alongside the damned. It is this empathetic suffering that she asks God to alleviate. Unlike the philosophical and theological pleas of her male counterparts, the bodily compassion exhibited by the suffering mother of Jesus is not limited to the other world, but is directly connected to early Marian practices. In the six books Apocryphon, the Greek Apocalypse of Mary, and the Ethiopic Apocalypse of Mary, Mary's intercession is, in hell is linked to the living practice of calling upon the name of Mary or commemorating her. When Mary asks the archangel Michael for mercy for the sinners in the Greek apocalypse of Mary, the Lord intervenes, responding, hearken all holy mother of God, if anyone names and calls upon thy name, I will not forsake him, either in heaven or on earth. Here, Mary's name, like her son's, offers early followers access to the other world. So now I've shared with you these scans of um, two of the primary texts, the Ethiopic Liberi Requi and a translation of one of the Greek apocalypses of Mary from the Vatican manuscript. Both of these are translated by Stephen Shoemaker, by the way. Um, and then I thought we would discuss together what it meant for Mary to descend to hell as apocalyptic seer in her unique composite role as mother, apostle, spiritual mother, intercessor, redeemer, or co-sufferer. And I, we can also talk about any other questions or, or thoughts that you might have. Um, for the Libra Requi, we will read chapters 94 to 101, which is pages 30 to 31 in the PDF. Um, so I apologize, you have to scroll quite a bit, but the full PDF is available on Oxford's website now. Um, it's appended at the end of one of um, Stephen Shoemaker's books. And so it's nice that it is standalone available as a PDF for us online. And then the Greek Apocalypse of Mary Vatican manuscript will read in its entirety. It's pretty short. You'll notice that there's two columns, the Ethiopic and the Syriac. Um, I'll be reading from the Ethiopic column, which is the, we think the best manuscript evidence for this text, although the text is corrupt in some places. Okay. Chapter 94. Then Jesus made Michael rise saying, Michael, my chosen one, rest from your weeping. Do you love them more than the one who created them? Or will you be more merciful to them than the one who gave them breath? 
And before you asked on their behalf, Michael, I did not spare my blood, but I gave it for their sake. Oh, Michael, was there not one who remained in pain, having abandoned the pleasure of Jerusalem? I was conceived in the womb for their sake to give them rest, and I wept before my father. And you, Michael, for the one moment you have beseeched my father on their behalf. But my blood has not rested, beseeching the father day and night on their behalf. And when the father wants to show them mercy from torment, they will be returned to the right hand. And I saw those who are in the interior place, who are immersed in blood, and my mercy has been turned away from them. And the cherubim are distributed by the weeping and the petitions, and they clap their hands together from my petition to the Father on behalf of the souls of those who are in torment. And the Father turned and said to me, I desire mercy, and my mercy is great. But what is placed before you is as great as your blood. Now then, Michael, arise, and we will show the apostles what it is. And when Michael got up, the Lord said, Arise, apostles, and see what it is. And then they saw a man whose mouth was a flaming razor, which burned, and he was not able to speak. Then Mary and the apostles cried out, saying, Who is this man who is in torment? And he said, He is a reader, who spoke glorious words, and he did not do them. Because of this, he is in great torment. And then they saw another person who had been led from afar with a great punishment of fire in his hand, and he was not allowed to speak. And young children were biting him on his sides with many others. And the apostles said, who is this one who does not receive mercy while there is fire in his hands? And they bring him and bite him. And the Savior said, this is the one who said, I am a deacon. And he took the glorious blood and did not care for it as he should have. And those who eat him are those who perished and did not see. Those who did what they should not have, and they returned from the temple and did not have mercy. And those who do not sin from now, but who see them and who have no sin, because they were serving in sin. And this will be with them until they finish their sin. And for this reason, they come and eat here as they eat them. And you'll see in the notes that In this section in particular, there's a lot of confusion about possible corruption to the text. And then we saw another person who was bound in torment. And there were two who kept him in darkness, and they were striking him on his face with round round stones as Hobet. And they did not have mercy on him, and they did not turn away, but they were striking him from the right and the left. And Mary said, Lord, who is this who has a great punishment more terrible than the others? And he receives no mercy at all. Why are they beating him with round stones as Hobet and his bones do not fall to the earth? And he said to her, every person has sinned. The one whom the two from the darkness beat with rocks in his face, how will they not be as dust? But he knows the affliction of human flesh. And if he gets up from this, a stone will be a great and horrible affliction upon him and he will not be dissolved. And the savior said to her, Mary, know who this is, and then I will tell you how his form is not dissolved. This is a priest whom the poor, destitute, and afflicted trusted, and he ate the memorials and first offerings, and not only by himself, but he gave them to those who were not worthy, and because of this, they beat him in his face, and if you want to know how his face is not dissolved, it is because he was an infidel from the place of believing, and his soul will not die and it will be in torment while not dying or being dissolved. Should have given you a little bit of a warning that these texts are extraordinarily violent. Sorry. Um, And when Jesus had said this, he gave them a way by which they could arise from the torment. And the Savior looked at Michael, and he separated himself from them, and he left Mary and the apostles so that they would understand them. Then those who were in the torments cried out and said, Mary, we beseech you. Mary, light and the mother of life. Mary, life and mother of the apostles. Mary, golden lamp. You who carries every righteous lamp. Mary, our master and the mother of our master. Mary, our queen, beseech your son to give us a little rest. And others spoke thus, Peter, Andrew, and John, who have become apostles. For they knew that each of them had been appointed as priests over the cities. And they said to them, where did you place our doctrine that we taught you? For the day is still coming when Christ will appear to you, and the Lord has appointed everything. And after everything, we fear God and all of his commandments. And they were very ashamed and could not reply to the apostles. The Savior arose and came to the place of torment, and he said to them, Where did you place what they taught you? Did you not hear everything that they said? 
and they did not answer and they spat at him and did not listen. Am I not able with a wink of my eye to smash heaven and earth to pieces onto the sinners who have sinned against me? But I have not done this in order to show you my plan. And so that you will know that you will go just like them. Nevertheless, you have not done this except for their condemnation, which you have done. You were reviled, you were you persevered, and you were oppressed. Because of this, you will be repaid. And what joy have I prepared for you? Because of the tears of Michael, my holy apostles, and my mother, Mary, because they have come and have seen you, I have given you nine hours of rest on the Lord's day. Then he made a sign to the mighty angels with his eyes, and he made it appear as the earth. And then something unexpected happened. And the apostles came to paradise, and they sat under the tree of life. And the soul of Abraham was there, and the soul of Isaac, and the soul of Jacob, along with many others whom the Savior had brought from death to life by his resurrection and placed in the paradise of the living. David was there with his harp making music, and Elizabeth Elizabeth was there with them, although there was another place for women. And the Magi were there, those who went up because of the Savior, and the little children were there because of the Savior. And we also saw great and wonderful things, namely all the souls of the good people who had gone forth from their bodies, all those who went forth and are reclining in the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So um, that occurs after Mary's dormition and, and she, her assumption into heaven. This text is much earlier than the other tours of Mary, and it offers you not only a tour of hell, but a specific description of the way that Mary descends to hell and sees the torments of hell and begs for mercy from her son um, before she is ensconced in heaven, um, just like the descent whose tradition has Jesus descending to hell um, before taking his place at the throne in heaven. So um, that's the book of the of Mary's repose. We don't have time to read the entirety of the Greek apocalypse of Mary. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that. I was <laughs> so um, you have it in front of you and it follows um, a similar pattern in the sense that um, Mary is um, seeing the torments of hell and she is con consistently asking, who are these people? And then they're identified with a particular sin. And then the end of the text concludes with her um, begging for mercy for the damned. Um, in all of Mary's tours of hell, she is successful in winning a respite for the damned. She is especially successful in the um, when she tours hell with Paul in the Armenian apocalypse of Paul, where hell is completely demolished. Um, and, uh, there is no more damnation, uh, but you see a similar pattern of particular periods of rest, um, in the Greek apocalypse of Mary, they're given 50 days, um, in the period of Easter. So those are just two samples of a kind of large tradition and it's a tradition that has not been given a lot of attention because in part because they're um occurring in different places for a long time the dormition narratives were treated separately from the apocalyptic texts because of generic distinctions between those types of literature um, but it's very clear that they're in conversation with one another in antiquity in some way so since it's nearly quarter of the hour. I'm happy to open it up for discussion and questions and I'll stop my screen share so that I can see you all. Well, thank you very much, Professor Henning. That was really uh, fascinating. And I would also like to um, invite you to uh, ask your questions. Uh, now we are all familiar uh, with the routine on Zoom either by raising uh, the hand in the Zoom function, function or typing in your uh, questions in the chat. You mentioned the book was published last year. Yes, fall of two, uh, September of 2021. Wonderful. So if there are no more questions, I think I'd like to thank you.
Professor mm -hmm. Henning, for this fascinating talk. Thank you all for the discussion. And last but not least, thank you, Thea, for the organization of uh, today's talk and discussion. And uh, I would also like to uh, draw your attention to our next uh, uh, event in the forum. Uh, the next talk will be by Dr. Hannah Shaham Rospi from the Ben Gurion University in Israel on the 12th of December. And the title of your talk will be Elijah, the Prophet's Varied Eschatological Roles in Jewish and Christian Discourse. And sounds also very promising and fascinating. So, wishing you a pleasant evening and hope to see you soon. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you for having me.